Hi, this is Pastor Dan Kramer from Zion Christian Church in Pittsburgh. This program will give you a glimpse into the life of an amazing group of people who are seeing God do tremendous things. We trust that you're encouraged by our rich worship service and the ministry of God's Word. We'd love to have you visit with us here some Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. We'd love to make you welcome, and I know the Holy Spirit would encourage you. We take time in His presence to enjoy Him. Love to have you do that with us here at Zion Christian Church. Now, I came to the Lord when I was six years old. I'm 50 years old today. I've been walking with the Lord a long time. You know, anytime you go to places and you see other people's lives, you always want to hear people's testimonies. Well, how, what did God do in your life? You know, I have a friend named uh, Mr. Popchus, and some of you guys might have known him speaking at banquets. But he said, everybody has a story, and everybody is a story. You know, if you look at your life, your story is how did Jesus come into your life and change who you are to make you who you are? Because we're not about ourselves. You know, that's one of the greatest things when you guys do food banks. Food banks aren't about you. It's about serving each another. You know, a lot of you guys are familiar with the passage. Go ahead if you have your Bibles. Let's go ahead and turn to um, John chapter 15. And verse 13, you guys are all familiar with this passage. They love to use this passage always around Veterans Day or anytime somebody's died in, in war or given their life. You know, they always have the picture of somebody giving their life by somebody jumping on a hand grenade as they come into a foxhole. You know, that's what everybody thinks of this scripture when you read it. And you know, verse 13 says, Greater love has no man that he laid down his life for his friend. You know, we all have that picture of what that means to jump on a grenade, or to give our lives. Oh, he died saving somebody. You know, that's always the picture of somebody dragging somebody out from a burning house, gets a child out, and he dies. You know, that's what people think that scripture means. That's actually not exactly what that scripture means if you look at a couple words in it. Where it talks about that word life, if you look it up in the Greek, that word is suke. And the word suke is used for your emotions, your own desires, and your mind. So that scripture is really saying Greater love has no one that he lays down his own personal agenda for somebody else, his own personal desires. You guys talk about doing a food bank. It takes hours to prep the bags to get everything ready. You're laying down your time. You're laying down your life. You know, a lot of people say, well, you know, missionaries go and they die as martyrs. Yes, people go die as martyrs. And I was sitting this morning just thinking where I was last year today. Where I was last year today, I was on the western side of of China on the Tibetan border area, and we were going to visit Tibetan Christians. And we just came up over a mountain pass. It was about 15,000 feet. And our friend uh, Daniel and Gail, they were Chinese believers, they were taking us through the mountains. We're going to visit his disciples. To visit his disciples takes a day to go to visit this one, another day to go visit that one, up and down the mountain roads. So as we came up over the mountain pass, there was a beautiful sunset before us. We said, wow, look at the glory of the Lord. So we came, started down over the mountain. Is anybody, I know Dan, Pastor Dan's been in Nepal. Is, some, is there Nepalis here today? I think there might be some. Anybody driven overseas? Anybody been overseas? You guys like the way people drive overseas? Well, my uh, Chinese brother, you know, he's up in the mountain roads, and he comes up over the mountain pass. He's doing about 60 to 70 miles an hour down this mountain road. And it's nice, nicely paved Chinese mountain roads. Unlike a lot of countries, China builds beautiful roads. Okay? You can go on a Chinese road and not have potholes, or you could drive on a Chinese road, and it's horrible. Okay? But this road was beautiful up over this mountain. We come down. It's starting to get dark. We look in the valley. It's all clouded over. And we go through a tunnel, and on the other side of the tunnel, there's just a little bit of ice on the road. It's like, oh, no problem. Daniel just accelerates. He just goes around the next bend, and he goes around the next bend. And as he went around the next bend... He was going about 60 miles an hour, and as he went around, he realized that he's sitting on black ice, and he hits the brakes. What don't you do? You do not hit your brakes. So Daniel flying down the mountain, oh, I forgot to tell you, the drop on the side's about five to 6,000 feet straight down, okay? So we come down, and as we, we hit the ice, everybody in the vehicle is praying in tongues, and Jesus, Jesus, you hear everybody cry out for the Lord. And as he hit the ice... He spun the, the van spun around and it hit it into a big concrete barrier on the cliff side, then slid to this other side and stopped right before there was a ditch about this big where his wheels just touched. Okay. 
The only problem is where we stopped was the only place on the road that had a Jersey barrier as protection. We looked up the road, there's nothing. We looked down the road, there's nothing. Where we wrecked was the exact spot. You know, God wanted us to wreck there. Uh, okay, I, I could say that. But we hit in such a place that we would have died. In that time, when we hit, it was dark. If our van would have went over, nobody would have known we were there. Because as we got to the bottom of the mountain, the road was closed. The Chinese guards have closed the roads because the ice was too bad. Nobody told us, you know. So as we hit the, hit the ice, spun around, and it's just like God's providence saved our lives. You know, were we there to die on, in the backside of China, preaching the gospel and encouraging believers? No. You know, my wife doesn't always encourage me to go die somewhere, you know. <laughs> but as we looked at that, it was God's protection in our lives, that we hit the right place at the right time, and we stopped. The roads were so bad, you guys will laugh at this, you know, in, up in this area, if they don't salt the roads, everybody slides down the hills, right? So you guys are, live in Brentwood, and my wife's family's from Brentwood, Carrick area. Okay, so I used to come over here when I got married to my wife. I never came to the South Hills before. There's funny people live here. You know, I'm from over on the other side of the Allegheny River. I don't know if you know anything about Pittsburgh people. They hate crossing rivers, okay? Once you cross the river, that's really far away, okay? <laughs> you know, I grew up between Springdale and Trenum in the Pittsburgh area, and if we crossed the Allegheny River to go to Monroeville, that was like an all-day event to go 20 minutes, Okay? You know, nobody would drive into Oakland, and definitely nobody would come down to the South Hills. It's dangerous down here. You know, there's people everywhere, okay? But you live, in the, you live outside of Pittsburgh, and you're scared of the city, you know? But, you know, God puts us in places where we're not always comfortable in. You know, as we look at that passage, it says what? Greater love has no one than lay down his life for his friends. But right above that scripture, in uh, number, uh, verse 12, it says, This is my commandment, that you love one another... As what? As I have loved you. You know, that's what we're called to be. We're called to be people who love like Jesus. You know, in that passage in uh, Matthew 25, it talks about if you've done it to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. I think it's really interesting that Jesus used that word, brethren, in that chapter. Who's your brethren? People you're sitting with, aren't you? You know, it's really interesting. We always want to look at, we need to go re give food to the, the dying, lost masses. And sometimes we forget about our own brethren. There are people around the world today who are in the church who suffer for Jesus every day. You know, um, I just came back last uh, month. I was in North India. Anybody familiar with North India? Ever hear of Kashmir? Kashmir is a part of North India. It's a small state right between Pakistan and China. It sits right at the top of... Um, India. And what's neat about this place, it isn't your typical Indians, okay? The people who settled Kashmir Valley came from Persia. So they're all Persians, about 500,000 Persians came and they settled in this valley and they are all Persian Muslim people. We work with a small church, it's called All Saints Church. It's the only church in Shinagar, which is the capital of Kashmir. The pastor, Pastor Sonny Vinny, that's his name, Sonny Vinny. Who's the associate pastor? Sonny Vino. They're a bunch of, uh, it's the mobsters. They all ended up in North India, okay? You think you're with the godfathers. You got the Vino and Vinny, okay? So, you know, you would not think of them as being Indian pastor's names, but that's who they are. And what's neat about these two guys, both of these have suffered for Jesus, you know, in having a church in this area. The All Saints Church is a, a church that goes back to the British days. Synagogue, if anybody's familiar with it, in the Kashmir Valley, when it would get real hot in Delhi, about 120 degrees in the summertime, they would move the whole government to Kashmir. Because Kashmir is at 5,000 feet, it sits on a beautiful lake, it's mountains in our background, and they would go there and get cool. Everybody like 120 degree weather? No, okay. And uh, believe it or not, if you were following anything with Indian news, or last week it was 38 degrees in Delhi, okay. Not Celsius, but Fahrenheit. They were freezing with us, okay? Today we're blessed. 50-some degrees, not bad for January. You know, but as we're up there in uh, Kashmir, we're with uh, Pastor Sonny. He was sharing with us that how many Christians are remaining in that valley. After the British left, the church came under great persecution. Now there are 8 million Muslims in that valley, and there's only 240 Christians in that whole area among that. You know, when we talk about unreached peoples, I know this church has a real heart for missions. 
You know, Kashmir Valley has 0.001% Christian. You know, it's one of the most unreached people places on the planet. You know, today, uh, and if you follow it, they've been fighting since 1947 between India and Pakistan over the Kashmir Valley. This summer, there was over 15,000 people injured in rioting in Kashmir. Out of that, there was about another 1,000 that received shotgun wounds from the police. You know, there was a lot of fighting, you know, and, and out of that, you know, we're sitting with Pastor Sonny, and we were asking him, what's your greatest need? He said, right now, we need people to come as eye surgeons to repair eyes that have been damaged by the shotgun blast. Out of that, there was, th- there was may- maybe 120 people blinded, another 1,000 who received eye injuries because of shotgun blasts. You know, so that was the need. So we were looking at Muslim people who were shot in the eyes, and you have a, a pastor named Vino and Vinny who want to reach out with them and show God's love. You know, so as we're there, we ended up getting a, a eye surgeons from South India who are good Christian guys who actually rebuild eyes. So they're, part of their thing is they actually rebuild the, the human eye with silicon and different things. So they went up with us, and as we're sitting there to do all these operations that we were going to do, a Muslim guy comes up to us who's in charge of the whole medical program and said, we don't need you anymore. We're done. You can take your people, and you can leave. Okay, I just flew surgeons to be here. You know, we have a medical team here. It's like you go ever have, it's like the greatest disappointment ever. You know, it's like, okay, Lord, we just put a lot of effort to have everybody here. You know, it's like I got a surgeon who's, a, he who's repaired 15,000 eyes. Who's going to repair these eyes? And the guy said, we don't need you Christians. We don't want you here. You can leave. And it's like, I, we, yeah, some of you guys know Mark Geppert. Mark Geppert was with me at the time. We looked at each other and said, okay, what to do? And as what we said that, we just started repeating to each other the scriptures of encouragement. You know, God, does, you know, God always makes things work together for good. You know, just that whole thing. And as we're standing there saying that back and forth, we looked to the guy and said, what is your dream? This is a, he's a Muslim doctor. What's your dream? He said, my dream is to have a high-tech school for the blind to serve those injured this summer in India. And we, we just prayed together and said, we'll do it. We'll come and help you set up a school for the blind. It just happens that son, Pastor Sonny is also in charge of the largest mission school, missionary uh, elementary and high school in the valley. 3,000 students come to their school. And his friend happens to be a spirit-filled Catholic lady who runs the Catholic mission school that has another 3,000 uh, Indian leaders in it. It isn't just poor Indians. These are rich Indians. These are all the leadership. You know, we go and we talk to different high-ranking people, everybody in Kashmir who somebody went to one of these two schools. They all have a common bond. So as we're talking with this guy, he said, yeah, I went to that school. Okay, so this man just spent 12 years of his life in a Christian school. So, and as we talk with them, he said, okay, let's go ahead, and how do we dream this dream to build a school for the blind? And so we came back to Pittsburgh, of course, went to Western Pennsylvania School for the Blind, and we just put together a package, and we sent it to them, saying, okay, we'll walk with you in helping set up a school, and we want the Christian schools to be a partner in that. So as people come in to receive surgeries, they'll also know about Jesus. We won't do it unless we do it in the name of Jesus. And Muslims, you know, that was that one day we got that biggest disappointment. Within the next three days, the Lord opened up opportunities for us to meet everybody up to what's known as the chief minister of India. The chief minister just happens to be like the governor, but more powerful. Nothing happens in that area unless she approves it. And her father was martyred. Her sister was kidnapped. This lady serves as a Muslim among Muslims, and she just also happens to have a sister who's a surgeon in Philadelphia. You know, God put us in the right place in the right time to get this approval from this one woman. And now we have the approval to help set up a school for the blind and minister in that country, in North India, to people who what? Who need to know love. That's one thing about Islam that a lot of people don't understand. Islam is not a religion of love. You know, Christianity is unique. We are unique because of love. What's our first command? What? Love God. Second command, love our neighbor as ourselves. Hinduism, as you guys work with a lot of Hindus in the area, a lot of the Nepalis are Hindus. You know, in Hinduism, they don't love each other. Did you know the word love is not a very common used word in Nepal? 
or thank you, as you guys have all learned danyaba in the meantime, okay? But within that culture, people don't do things out of love. They do it out of duty. Husband and wives, do you love when you're, well, you have to, for wives, I'll pick on wives since my wife's not here, okay? <laughs> wives, do you love to do things for your husband out of it's your duty to serve him? You do it out of love, you know? What's easier, out of duty or out of love? You know? If it was your duty to give bags of food to people, would you have a, all right, here's your bag, here's your bag. Oh, you're again, you, know, you stink, here's your bag, <laughs> you know? You know, we think about that. How do we serve God? Do we do it out of duty or do we do it out of love? You know, you go to a Nepali home, and they bring you a cup of chai or a cup of tea, you know, and of course they bring it to you, oh, they must really like me, because they're like bringing me tea. No, it's our duty as part of their culture to say, thank you for coming to my house. You know, they're known for their hospitality, you know. I was blessed uh, the first time to go to Nepal in 1984. How many people were alive in 1984? I know a lot of these ones weren't, okay? In 1984, I spent a month in Nepal. And I was in my senior year of high school. I took a month off of high school, October. I took the whole month of October in my senior year off to go to Nepal. It's crazy. No senior ever takes a whole month off. I went to a Christian school, so I had a little bit of grace, okay? So I went to Nepal. You know, we, I was the youngest guy to go trekking at that time. During that time in Nepal, it was great persecution in the country. If you shared the gospel with somebody, you would go to jail for three years. If you water baptized somebody, you'd go to jail for six years. That was the penalty. If you got caught doing evangelism and you didn't go to jail, they would, they would just kick you right out of the country. Okay? And that's when I went. And I went in Nepal, and we, we did literature. You know, and I didn't get arrested, but my friend Mark Eppert, some of you guys know Mark, he was arrested five times in one month for doing literature. They've actually kicked him out a bunch of times. Okay, but I was blessed. Hey, I didn't get to go to jail, so that's good. So I finished high school. I go to Bible school, finish Bible school, and I go back to Nepal. 1987, 21 years old, back to Nepal. I'm going to go live and die on the hills of Nepal preaching the gospel. That was my dream. You know, a lot of people ask, what does a, what does a 21-year-old Christian crazy person dream about? Dying on the hills of Nepal preaching the gospel. Okay. And back in those years, it was easier to do. Okay. You know, I, I was over there just last month, you know, and, um, where we have, uh, it's called Mendy's Haven. It's an orphanage. We've been working with them for years. They used to be in, Jol- in Kathmandu Valley. They've moved outside. That's where I, I used to live at an orphanage. Sounds really bad. You lived at an orphanage. Okay. So I lived at an orphanage when I wasn't out on the trails. And, you know, Mendy's Haven, where it is, it's about eight kilometers from what's known as the Ring Road that goes around Kathmandu Valley. And we used to have to walk up to that. Mendy's Haven, because the buses and taxis wouldn't take you up because the road was too rough. So what we would do, we would walk up and down, praying for the villages, praying, prayer walking, back and forth. And I went this last December over to Nepal, and Charles, our friend, he told us now there are 22 churches on that road, from the Ring Road to Mendy's Haven, that never existed before. You know, we forget about sometimes that God just puts in our hearts love for people, and as we pray for them, God brings change. You know, I look at this area, Carrick area, you guys have an awesome opportunity to preach the gospel to people who you could never preach the gospel to before. Now, I understand there's some Syrian refugees coming in and different things like that. You got the Nepalis. Nepalis are great. Nepalis are nice people, okay? That's one thing about Nepalese folks. They're nice folks. You know, you have mean people too. I resettled, uh, anybody ever meet a Somali? Somebody from, from Somalia? Okay, I was uh, work for about work with the World Relief for four years, reselling refugees in Pittsburgh back from 1990 to 94. So that was my old old life. And you know, after Nepal, I came home. Let's do refugees. So my wife and I we started doing refugees, and we had Somalis come in. Somalis hated us so bad. When we would pick them up at the airport, they said, "Where are you going? Where are you taking us?" Well, I have a family for you to stay with. You see, they said, "We hate Christians. We hate you." We don't want you. You know, it's like, okay. I mean, we would get them into an apartment, okay? One, we got into a house. There's a one Somali family, husband, a wife, and a baby. And this other mother and her son came. I asked them, well, it would be okay if this lady would stay with you a couple days until we get them into an apartment. No problem. I get called by the cops two days later to come to the house. That Nepali, that um, Somali lady got mad that she was staying with one of the peoples that they hate in Somalia. They were warring tribes. This woman was so mad, she broke out all the windows in her part of the house she was staying in, even took a couch and threw it out the window. 
I mean, this is a, this lady is only this big, you know? But that hate, that anger in her eyes. You know, okay, I, we came, the police are there. I said, you know, Mr. Richardson, we could take her to jail tonight, or if you want to, just take her, put her in a hotel, and everything will be fine, you know, just pay for the repairs. I said, okay, I could do that. She said, no, I don't want your help. I want to go to jail. <laughs> Who in their right mind wants to go to jail? Okay, she said, so she did. The police took her and put her in jail. They released her the next day. I mean, it's like, then we had to move her and stuff like that. So we ended up having her in East Liberty with some other Somalis of her own ethnic type, okay? And, you know, when I got her settled into her next apartment, I asked her, what do you need? She said, I need Somali clothes, and I want a lot of lamb. It's like, okay. I know where there's a butcher who does the lamb. We could get you that. But Somali clothes in Pittsburgh... It's going to be really hard, okay? So I ended up saying, well, what I'll do is I'll give you some money. Gave her $200. You know, you can buy your clothes that you like. You know, there's some different shops that could probably give you something similar. Okay. So uh, uh, that was on a Monday. I got a call on Thursday that she had just moved to Georgia. What? She just moved to Georgia. I guess she had a relative, so she left. So we go back to her apartment to clean it out. You know, we also, she said, I need a television. So we took our television from our house and gave it to her. Okay, so go there Thursday to help clean up the apartment, whatever's left. There it is, our television smashed in the corner of the, 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 the apartment. The $200, I found it ripped up in a trash can. Yes, I did take it out. I taped it up and I took it back to the bank. Okay, it's, it's God's money. But you know what, the Lord taught me in that is how much are we willing to love people? You know, people are hard to love, you know. Today, a lot of you guys are going to be watching a football game tonight, and not, most of you will not have positive words for Mr. Brady, okay, or Mr. Belichick, okay. I grew up in Pittsburgh, you know, I know the fight songs, I know it all. I know Jarella's Gorillas, you know, this is, you know, you got the, you got the Pittsburgh polka, okay, you, you got it all, okay. So, but we look at that, how do we love people? You know, how do we truly love people? You know, let's go back to John chapter 15. You know, part of it is, where do we live in the Lord? It says, I am the true vine, and the Father is the vine dresser. Every branch that is me does not bear fruit, he takes it away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it might bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the words I have spoken. Abide in me. And as a branches cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. You know, this whole passage starts about talking about abiding in the Lord. You know, I love that word abide because it's a special word. You know, not to be show off of Greek or anything. I mean, it's meno. It means to voluntarily stay under, to submit. We voluntarily stay with the Lord. You know, in our world today, it's easy to hop around to do whatever you want. You know, People get divorced, people get remarried, da 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 You know, people say, well, I'm not happy with that church, they go to another church. I'm not happy with that church, they go to another church. But in our relationship with the Lord, where do we stay? Do we stay with him, in him? You know, that's a big part of our journey as Christians. Where do we stay? Do we constantly look at our source in our life is the Lord? Do we trust in the Lord with all our hearts and lean on our understanding, you know, where do we do? How do we trust? How do we walk in the Lord? You know, the Bible says, what? If it's not a faith, it's sin. You know, we are called to have a great faith in God. You know, if you, have, you get born again, you're saved. I always know people say, well, I got born again. I was all fired up for the Lord. Da, 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 and now it's got not the same. Why? You know, I got saved when I was six. Okay? I had a lady doing vacation Bible school. She invited us to come up because who wants to go to hell? No! Who wants to go to heaven? Yes, okay, I'll come up and I'll pray. Yeah. Yes, God touched my heart. I became a Christian and I got born again. You know? Why? Because some lady said, Do you want to go to hell? No. Do you want to go to heaven? Yes. Okay, well, I'll come and receive Jesus. Simple faith. Some of us need to get back to that place where we just remain in Jesus and have simple faith. I love simple. I love being in simple countries. You know, I love places that are dirt. You know, um, people always laugh at me. Bill, why do you always work in the hard countries? Because I like dirt. You know, I like countries where God's at work because everybody's at the bottom. Some of you guys are familiar. I know you guys have a great worship team. 
How many have ever heard the name of Fanny Crosby? Fanny Crosby was a great hymn writer, okay? Fanny Crosby was an interesting lady because she was blind. You got two blind guys, okay? Fanny Crosby was blind, but she would go to the big London mission to eat with all the homeless people every day. And people would ask her, why did you sit beside that person? She said, I went and found the smelliest man to sit beside so I could pray for him. A blind lady did the hymns, go find the stinkiest, dirtiest person. Blind people can't see, but they can smell. She would walk around until she found the smelliest person to sit beside and show the love of Jesus. You know, that's always an inspiration to me, that story, because it's true. She would go every day to the mission, the London missions, and find somebody who stunk so bad that nobody else sat beside her, she would sit beside her. You know, what are we willing to do for Jesus? You know, how far are we willing to love one another? I preach to myself too. You know, I'm, I'm a human being. You know, we love certain things and we don't love certain things. You know, it's not part of our nature to always want to be in the dirt. How many people like a clean house? I like a clean house, you know? You go to Nepal, a clean house in Nepal is a dirt floor that the wife just mopped that morning, and that's a clean house in Nepal. They live on a dirt floor that the wife mops every day. And how do they make their walls? They get mud, and they mix it with manure. They dry it on the side of their house, and they make that part of their walls. They have thatch, and they put the mud and manure on the walls. Then they smooth it off. They paint it. So you live on a dirt floor, and you have mud and manure walls. But that's what they have. And if you walk in their house, they'll show love to you. You know, that's one of the things I've got to see in Nepal that a lot of people didn't. I went in 1984. There was 25,000 Christians in the country of Nepal. Now there's over a million. And one thing about Nepali Christians and Nepali Hindus, you can always look in their face and see Jesus. There's a difference between a Hindu and a Christian Nepali to see the love of Jesus. It's not that they don't have a tikka or whatever. You just see that love of Jesus. And that's what we're called to do. We're called to show our lives as love of Jesus. I know you guys are familiar with this passage also, but in Matthew chapter 5, you know, Jesus is uh, doing the Sermon on the Mount. In chapter 5, in verse, we'll start at verse 11. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 11. I love verse 11 because it talks about a lot of times who we are when we really live our lives for Jesus. You know, we make a difference in our lives. In verse 11 it says, Blessed are you when they revile you and persecute you and take all kind of evil things against you falsely for my sake. You know, there's people probably say stuff about Pastor Dan falsely because he has a heart for Nepalese, he has a heart for his people of his church. That pastor's crazy. He's got 100 feet in those Nepalese, man. What do they need? Just give them a bag of rice. Who cares? They even need that. They came here. They're a bunch of foreigners. Weren't you not all foreigners in this room? Yeah, my family came over after World War I. You know, my grandmother and her, my grandfather at that time, they fled the Bolsheviks in Russia. Okay? And my other side, they fled World War II and from England. So, you know, that's who my families came in this century. I didn't come off, off of uh, the Mayflower and land on Plymouth Rock. I'm a newbie. You know, that's why we aren't rich. We don't have anything. You know, we're new, okay? We're a bunch of bums who showed up and God blessed, you know? But in our lives, you know, what do we do when people start talking bad about us? You know, we kind of want to avoid them. But God wants us to love them, okay? He says, blessed. Are you who what? Who say all kind of evil against you falsely for my sake. Do we forget we do all these things for God's sake, my sake, Jesus' sake? You know, as we continue on, it says, verse, verse 12, Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecute the prophets who were before you. It's interesting that Jesus doesn't even take a breath, and he says the next words. It says what? Verse 13, You are the salt of the earth. He goes from being, you're persecuted to you're the salt of the earth. You guys have all known you guys are all supposed to be salty Christians, right? You're supposed to be salty, okay? Not peppery, but salty, okay? So, you know, so what? It says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? 
and if the good and then it's good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled under feet by men. You know, we're called to be savory. What does that mean? You taste good to the world because you reflect Jesus. You know, that's what we're supposed to. How many people enjoy a good meal? You know, to a, to a Nepali Hindu, bringing him a steak is not his idea of a good meal. Some dal bhat tarkadi, you know, rice and lentils and, you know, some vegetables, that's his idea of a good meal. And they'll eat that same meal three times a day. To us, it's like, ugh, slop on a plate with curry and there's a chili that'll burn my mouth. Okay. Pastor Dan has eaten a lot of dal bhat tarkadi, you know, so... You know, as we look at this, what do we see? You know, what do we see when we're the salt of the earth? You know, in verse 14, it says, You are the light of the world, a city that is sat on a hill that cannot be hidden. We're light. You know, one thing I grew up, I grew up in uh, Day Spring Christian Center. Some of you guys might have remembered Ray Patterson. He pastored Day Spring Christian Center back in the 80s, 90s. That's where I, I grew up in the Lord there. And he always had a joke. He always said, brighter the light, the more bugs the church attracts. So as your church is light, you got the light of God moving it, you will have some buggy people come through the church. So Pastor Dan, shine bright, you got the bugs coming, okay? You know, not to pick on anybody in church, say you're buggy, okay? But as I know, because I served on that church staff for a couple years when I was in my early 30s, okay? But, you know, we would have people. And my, my ministry role in the church was I was the community ministries pastor and also I ran the Bible school and the food bank and missions. That was my role. So I got to be out doing a soup kitchen, having a clothing ministry, and the food bank I was responsible for, and Bible school students, which were half of them were from Asia. Okay. And I still remember the one girl from Asia who was from Singapore. Anybody been to Singapore? But Singapore is one of the cleanest countries in the world. It's illegal to chew gum in Singapore. <laughs> Seriously. Okay. You get caught chewing gum, it's a 500 Singapore dollar fine because they don't want you taking your gum and throwing it on the street. A very clean place, okay? So I had this girl come in from Singapore. She's 18 years old, and we put her in Trenum, okay? What's Trenum like? Well, yeah, for people who don't know what Trenum's like, it's like being put up in the Hill District, okay? You know? So going into that, and she walked into the one family's house, and the pup people had a puppy dog, and the puppy dog basically left a mess on the floor. And she just didn't see it, and she walked into it. This is a Singaporean girl coming to Bible school, walks in a mess, and she just starts cussing. You know, it's like culture shock to the ultimate degree. You know, and I say, you know, she comes back, she's blah, 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 complaining about all this. Because in Singapore, the S word and the P word are not swear words. They're common language. But in America, they're all cuss words. Okay, so she said, oh, you know, beep, 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 beep. Okay, and I said to her, Morel, you need to love these people. What do you mean love these people? Aren't these people supposed to be clean Christian Americans who have their life together? No, they're just Christians who do not have their life together, and they just need somebody to love them. Oh, okay. So the next two years of Bible school I had with her, God broke into her life every day in dirty ways. Okay. Not dirty in a perverted way, but dirty ways. What do you mean we have to feed people at a soup kitchen? That lady smells. Yes, that lady smells, but she loves you. And you get to get to love her. Oh, okay. So it was breaking that down. You know, so as, us as Christians, how do we live our lives? How do we become a lighthouse? You know, it says what? Continuing on in there, it says, verse 15, Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a bushel, but the lampstand, that it might give light to the whole house. You know, some of you guys, when the power goes out, everybody searches for flashlights and candles. You guys live in western Pennsylvania. We live in Penn Hills. My power went off six times last year. Okay, we complained about that. I was in Nepal three weeks ago. That power went off every three hours. And we were up in Kashmir. We even lost the internet for three days because the government blocks internet access to that part of India because they don't want anybody to get news out. So it's always great to go on those type of trips and say, dear, if I call you, I call you. If I don't, I don't. Okay, because a lot of people do missions today and they read Facebook every day of what the missionary just did today. We used to go, to, I went to Nepal for six months straight one time. I lived there for two years at that time. And for six months, I did not hear one communication from anybody in America. I finally got a call because in 1988, there was a major earthquake like the one we just had a couple years ago in Nepal, and they called to see if I was alive. 
because it cost $50 a minute at that time to call back to the States. I mean, I lived in Nepal on $250 a month support. That was my support. I paid for my apartment. We had money for food. My rent was $75, okay? So, you know, that was my mission support back in 1987, 250 a month. Most people can't even feed the Steeler people tonight for $250, okay? <laughs> you know, so when we look at this, what do we see? Do we see, where do we put our light? Do we put it up on a lampstand so everybody sees it, or do we want to hide it? Okay. And what, is, what does it continue to say? In verse 16 it says, Let your light show shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. That's why we do good works. It isn't that we want to earn God's favor. You guys realize that? You don't do good works because you want to get close with God. You already did. Christ in you, the hope of glory. You can't butter up. Well, God, I'm going to do all this good stuff because I want a new car. It doesn't work that way, you know? Do this to get that. We don't live in that. We're not Roman Catholics, okay? We don't go pay for this and do so many of these so we get this. It doesn't work that way. You know, I'm not picking on Catholics, but they still do works to achieve things they want. We're not called to do works for achieving God's glory in our lives. We do good works of what? Men might see what? The glory of the Lord. They would see what? And glorify our God in heaven. You know, that's what we're all called to do. We want to see God's glory. You know, we start off the worship today all talking about revival. You want, revival is the glory of the Lord moving through a community, bringing change. That's what revival truly is. It's God, boom, showing up. Everybody closes the bars, everybody prays. You guys, I don't know if anybody's ever studied any of church history of revivals. You might have heard of the Welsh revivals. The Welsh revivals, Welsh revivals helping in the uh, U.K., and what they happened was that God moved so mightily among a, a coal mining community that they closed all the bars, they closed all the pubs, and in the pubs they would have hymn singing. Everything changed. The whole area became Christians. Could you imagine today in Pittsburgh if they had a revival and not one person drank a bottle of beer celebrating the Steelers? They all said, oh, we can't. We've got to go to church tonight. You know, it's hard to believe, isn't it? Okay. But those things happen. They closed everything. They all went to church. You know, um, Pastor Ed Popchus. You guys, have Pastor Ed ever come up from down at Washington? Okay. Okay, but uh, Pastor Ed, he was telling me about there was a revival in western Pennsylvania in 1880s. And the revival was so great that people would drive from all across Pennsylvania to go to Washington, PA, to a, 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 to a grove area where the Holy Spirit was pouring out. People were getting saved. People were getting healed. It was a great revival. Towns shut down because that happened here, Western Pennsylvania, Washington. You know, we want to see revival come. How do we see it come? You know, how do we live our lives that we are so reflective of who Jesus is? Does anybody know how a lighthouse works? You know, a lighthouse, most of you guys know there's a thing that spins and there's a light and it kind of reflects. But what's interesting about a lighthouse, it isn't the light shining out. It's the reflector of the light that shines out. And in our lives, Jesus is that light, and it reflects off of us. Our problem is how clean do we keep our mirror of our life? You know, do people see Jesus in us? I mean, that's my greatest thing. I want to see how people see me when I come into a place that there's something different about that guy because Jesus is in me. It's not because I'm six foot three. I don't care. I was born this way. My mom used to stretch me as a child, okay? You know, it's just who I am, okay? It's not easy to be six foot three in Nepal because every doorway is this tall, okay? So you're always going in, you know? So people say, oh, I'm born short. Good, you could go to Nepal and be a missionary. You'd never hit your head, okay? <laughs> but that's who I am. I, I stick out. I go to China, I stick out. I go to India, everywhere, everywhere in the world I stick out except America. You just kind of blend in. But I don't want to blend in. I want to have people to see Jesus in me. You know, that's my challenge to you today. What do people see in you? Are you that reflector? Do you reflect Jesus? And how do you do that? You do it through good works. You do it by loving people. And if you're kind, you know, a lot of my greatest counsel to married couples is be kind to each other. Be kind. Husbands, be kind to your wife. It says, love your wives. I don't know if you ever read that passage, but it never says, wives, love your husband. It says, husbands, love your wives. Why does it say that? Because wives naturally love their husbands. That's part of who they are. They're wired. They love their kids. Very few mothers will take their kids and say, I don't like you anymore. Chop your head off there. Okay, next one, chop your head off. Goodbye. 
that doesn't happen. Because you love your kids. You die for your kids, you know. You feed your kids before you feed yourself, you know, except if you're in Nepal. You know, in this passage where it talks about loving one another, I saw Nepali mothers cripple their children, break their legs, break their arms, and put them on little scooters, and they would scoot around their land just collecting arms because it was, they couldn't feed them, but they know that if they crippled them, somebody would give them money because they're a cripple. You know, back in the 90s, they don't do it anymore, but they, men used to get a razor blade, cut their stomachs open, let all their guts come out, and they would hold it in a bag and would walk up to people and say, I need money for an operation. Why? Because they didn't have God's love. They didn't know who Jesus was. They didn't know love. You know, but us as Christians, we love one another. And how do we love one another? By giving ourselves. Giving up our desires. You know, most people in the summertime would rather go sit on a boat on the Monongahela River then come to church on a Sunday morning. I'm not picking on boat owners, okay? But that's part of it. It feels good to your flesh. But how about your spirit? You know, what feels good in us? You know, aren't we not dwelling place of the Holy Spirit? Does not God reflect out of us? You know, just in closing today, this is where I just want to bring us back. It says, let your light show shine before men that say, see your good works. That's why you guys do a food bank. That's why you do a clothing ministry. So people could see your good works and glorify God. It's not about glorifying yourself. It's not about you. Do you guys all realize you stink if you sweat? Do you all realize that you don't, if you don't pick up your house, it'll become a mess? If you don't give your kids a bath, they'll really stink because they like to roll around in the dirt? You know, my son, I have a, my wife and I have a little adopted boy from China. He's, he's uh, three years old. We took him outside in the yard yesterday, and he had his big wheels, and he was riding up and down the hill. And his greatest joy is turning the big wheels around backwards, riding backwards, having a flip upside down, he'd roll in the mud and come up the other side and he's all covered with dirt. He'll just sit there and ha, 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 because he's dirty. And of course, we made a mistake of putting him in a white shirt before we sent him out, <laughs> you know. But he reflected the glory of the Lord by just his happiness just to be there. You know, us as Christians, are we rejoicing in the Lord for him allowing us to be where we're at to reflect him? You know, are we who God calls us to be? You know, just uh, that's like to pray for you guys. And turn it over to Pastor Dan. Dear Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for today, Lord. Thank you for this church. Thank you for getting behind you. And not just behind you, but you living in them and them reflecting the light of you to the community here, Lord. Father, we just ask you to just bless them. Pour out a mighty blessing upon them. Bless Pastor Dan, Lord. Continue to strengthen them, encourage them. Lord, we ask for a fresh anointing on him as he preaches the word. We ask for just a mighty move of the spirit through this church to the community. Lord, we know that you're faithful. You're a faithful God, and you hear us when we pray. And Father, I just ask for great and mighty things in your name, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for having me. Hi, this is Pastor Dan Kramer from Zion Christian Church in Pittsburgh. This program will give you a glimpse into the life of an amazing group of people who are seeing God do tremendous things. We trust that you're encouraged by our rich worship service and the ministry of God's Word. We'd love to have you visit with us here some Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. We'd love to make you welcome, and I know the Holy Spirit would encourage you. We take time in His presence to enjoy Him. Love to have you do that with us here at Zion Christian Church.